All right, so today's a lot about lighting. There's a little bit about sound, um, but not too much. It's mainly what we've already kind of gone over before. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on that at the end. Um, but today we're gonna be going over a few different things for lighting, how lighting can affect the mood of the scene and how you can use different things like color contrast, um, or if you wanna go more realistic or stylistic with your lighting and how that can affect the overall scene. So first talking about the mood of the scene and how lighting affects that. And as you can see, just in this image alone, changing the direction, changing how much of the light is available, um, changing where the light, the direction of light, where it's coming from, and then how much contrast from shadow to light there is, how flat the light is. And if there's high contrast in the background or low contrast or uh, if it's high key where the background's bright and so is the for and so is the uh, subject, or if it's low key lighting where the background is dark and the subject can either be bright or dark as well, these will all have a very dramatic and um, change shift in the uh, mood and the feel of the overall scene and what's going on. You can make a scene look like it's feeling empty, like it's feeling sad, like it's feeling dark and brooding, or you can make it seem happy and alive and welcoming, all just with the change of how much light and where you have that light coming from. It's all subjective, so there's no hard rule, hard or fast rules to any of this. Art's always subjective, so it can be adjusted to everyone's liking. Sometimes you'll see a movie, they have the lighting that would you know, generally speaking, be seen as a more dramatic mood. Um, and they use that for their happiest moments. You know, sometimes they, it works. Sometimes you just need to know what kind of effect it's going to have so that you can try to make sure you, you know, there's going to be some kind of barrier there and you're still um, giving off that, that feeling that you're trying to convey, even with using these different lighting techniques. But it's all it's all art, so it's all subjective and you can do however you like. Generally speaking, warmer tones like orange, tungsten light, it's gonna convey warmth, coziness, familiarity, happiness, other things like that. While cooler tones like the blue hue, um, night or day shift hue will convey cold, dark, lonely, sad, alone, scared and unfamiliar. We'll delve a little deeper into um, this subject later on high key versus low key lighting. But if you look at this image right here, that white background where he's really bright, and then you have that dark background, and then right next to it, you have, the, it's pretty dark. Most of the background's dark. He has a little bit of light and he's dark as well. Those are different uses of high key and low key lighting. High key lighting is, when we're talking about cinematography, it's mostly talking about the surrounding area, how bright the background is compared to your subject. Usually in a darker environment within cinematography, we will have our subject be a little bit darker as well, just to kind of match the feel. Um, but a low key lighting can also be that your subject is pretty well lit, but the background is completely dark, which also gives off a different mood. High key lighting is the opposite. The background is very well lit. The subject is usually really well lit as well. But like I said, there's different circumstances where you can have the subject be a little darker and still have the background lit and it'll still be considered high key lighting. Um, these are like some of the kind of differences. High key is a little bit more happy, more welcoming. There's more amount of light and the more amount of light there is, it usually conveys that, that openness to us and that warmth and that welcoming feel. Um, or like when there's happy general moments where somebody's having a good time. Those, these really bright scenes where this, the subject's really bright and the background's really bright, they really start to um, convey that feeling of, of, of happiness or um, you know something of that, something along those lines. Instead of the opposite low key lighting, which shows more kind of drama, brooding, anger, um, someone feeling sad or alone, things like that. So those are the two like really key contrasted lighting styles for high key, low key lighting. And we'll talk more about that later, like I said, um, but that's just like a general overview of those. So those are really good for setting moods of lighting, of course. 
Um, but the other ways of doing it, uh, we'll, we'll get into today. Um, like I said, the direction of your lighting can affect the mood. Lighting from below, like this picture on the top left, it gives off these kind of unnatural shadows. In general, when we go out and pub, when we go outside, we are used to the light being from above because of the sun. When we go inside, <clears throat> we generally have lights coming from the ceiling, shining down. So we're used to the shadows being um, underneath our eyes and underneath our nose or um, being fully lit like this middle picture. We're not really used to this picture in the top left where the light's coming from underneath, casting those, those very contrasted shadows to what looks natural to us. And that's why it can give off a very menacing look or a very like, you know, they use this a lot in horror. They use this a lot in when you're trying to really have your character pop out, look different, look unnatural, or just feel on edge. They usually can, this can be one of the ways to achieve that is by having the light come from underneath. While um, oppositely, having it come from above, you'll have the shadows underneath. You can still have, I think I'll have another picture of this. So, in this photo, you can see the top right, the, foot, the light's coming from above, but because it's coming directly above, she can still have that sort of menacing look um, because she is having those shadows around the sockets of her eyes and right under her nose. So she still has a kind of contrast on her face compared to the bottom right where the light's coming from up from underneath where she still has that menacing look, but it is a very different style. It is a very different look to it. So um, with everything, you can always adjust things and see what you like better, but um, just because it's coming from above doesn't mean it's gonna automatically mean that it feels welcoming. And just because it's coming from below doesn't mean it's gonna automatically feel unnatural. You can make those things kind of um, mix them and coincide with together, depending on how you do it. The main thing about it usually is the where the shadows are, how deep the shadows are, um, and if you're using any fill to contrast those shadows or just leaving them very, um, very dark compared to the light spots of the face. So that's, that brings me to the next thing, which is using harsh or soft light. Like we've learned this semester, we're using like different diffusion or bouncing your light can make it very soft. It adds a more welcoming feel. Um, if you look top left, that would be more soft light on her face where it kind of wraps around her, showing her entire thing. There's not much shadow, so it's a little more welcoming. Then if you look at the bottom left where it's very harsh lighting, there's um, the brights and the darks are very contrasted and her face kind of fades off into the shadow. That can also give somebody a menacing look or one of those more dramatic looks. And that's another thing about the shadows. It depends on how, how deep those shadows are compared to how bright those bright spots are. Um, and if you play around with that, you can get a different feel just in um, how menacing or how brooding or how sad that character might seem like they feel based on how dark those shadows are compared to how bright those bright spots are. The brights and the darks, the, the ratio between those are mm, where you get the um, different looks and the different feels. A higher contrast between lights and darks can add more drama and depth and seriousness, while less usually makes it a little more happy and fun, silly or romantic, depending on what you're going for. No contrast between the light and dark is creating what's called flat lighting, where neither side has any shadows. And that can be seen in certain sitcoms and comedies, other things like that. I'm not sure if I have a picture of it, but. Um, well, I would say that bottom one with the white background is pretty flat. So that would be something like that. It, like there's not really much shadow on his face. It's pretty evenly lit across the whole thing. And that's where you get that kind of flat lighting. There's no uh, definition. 
which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it just does change how he looks and how we feel about what his character is thinking. But like with everything else, story is gonna trump everything. So do what's best for the characters and the story. Don't just do it because it looks cool. Don't just do it because you think this will be better for um, the end movie. If it's not what the character is feeling, it's not conveying that emotion you're trying to tell with your movie, then you should probably shouldn't do it because the story is gonna be the main thing and the feeling you're giving off is what the audience is gonna be paying attention to. They wanna feel what that character feels or they want to feel what the story is telling them to feel during while watching that character if they're not supposed to be in the character's shoes um, and and doing these different lighting styles will will convey those emotions to your audience so you always want to pay attention to how that's going to affect the outcome of the final product whenever you're working on things like this oh, also a side note it's always good to cross-reference the same material um, as some people give incorrect information. There was a guy that said a high key light means that you're raising the key light up and low key means you're lowering it down. And everywhere else I've heard it, it just means that there's less light when it's low key and more light when there's high key. Um, and so, you know, just learning from one source, you might think that that's the way it is, but cross checking when you're trying to learn something new is always good to do. Now, as you can see, like the warmer tone on the right, it gives off a little bit more of a happy moment while the blue and the darker tone on the left gives off a little bit more of a cold, um, I don't know what to call it, but it gives off a different feel completely. Not just because, you know, obviously because the character is wet and she's looking down and not looking happy, but it's also just the general feel of the entire scene. And it could be even more so if we darken the background on the left side and darken more of her face, put more of her face in shadow. You know, she could start to look crazy or she could start to look even more angry, depending on how we mess around with this light. Pixar is known very well for their lighting, how they change the mood of every scene based on how they do their lighting within their animation. And you know, like, um, this is a spoiler, I guess, if you've never seen Toy Story 3, um, but this, this character. Yeah, it, that's not, that's your, pro, that's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been out forever, so sorry if you haven't seen it, but uh, the top, he, he feels like a, a friendly character, and you think that he might be able to help the main characters, and at the bottom, it's revealed that he's not so nice. He's actually leading the people that are, you know, trying to keep everybody in and trying to, like, uh, basically be the mob boss in the, in the, um, what is it called? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so those different lighting, those, just the style of lighting they did, it really shows the contrast between happy and more menacing. And Pixar is well known for this throughout all of their movies and all their scenes. They, they use lighting and they use the direction and the amount of lighting and all of that very well top is high key lighting there's the whole scene is pretty well lit while the bottom you can't really see much of the background there's a few characters that are a little bit lit but for the most part it's just the uh, backlight making that rim light around the character the um, stuffed animal and you know a little bit of light on him to, to kind of see him brooding in the shadows this guy looks creepy on both sides, I think, but it kind of shows how on the, the left side, it's, it's not as menacing as on the right side. Either way, I still think it looks kind of creepy. But I mean, that's just a, just a comparison between kind of a high and, and low contrast. Low key, I mean, sorry, high key and low key. The other thing that really affects it is color. Like I was saying, the main thing that we can do when we're just using lights without using anything else, um, we have tungsten lights, we have daylight lights, like HMI lights that use daylight. So um, these different lighting temperatures are gonna change the, the mood of the scene most of the time too. The, the brighter ones, the orange feeling feels more like home. Usually when you go inside of a home, you have these um, tungsten, 
temperature and lights that, that give off that warmer feel. So it feels a little more cozy. It feels a more familiar and, and like our home. So we just, we kind of uh, relate to it, I guess. And, and it just feels more inviting. And then on the right side, you have the, the more daylight light, the bluer light that is looking a little bit more sad and lonely. And not just that, you can also see how in the background, they are turning off all the practicals. They're not letting any light reflect off of anything. So they're making it a much darker tone. So you can see how even in the same space, you can really change the way it feels and looks just by turning off blocking light or changing the color temperature. And in the middle, it looks like they're using practicals and they are bringing it down a little bit. I would call this low key lighting as well. And so it's somewhere in between. <clears throat> On the color temperature, I'd say it's mm, somewhere in the middle between that, that really dark blue and that really bright orange. This is that same lady, but this time she's just frowning in every single one of them. Um, and you can see like in the orange one, it's not as, not as sad feeling as the blue one, I guess. Um, it gives off less of a lonely feel as the one on the top right and the bottom left. I think those two are the, those two match the, her facial expression the best based on um, just how they look. And then the other two, they, they still work, but they just, don't give off that same emotion, I feel. Then you have just all these pictures. It was just like showing a bunch of different moods and movies that have just different frames of the scene, and how the color and the lighting and how much light there is. Some of them have the character and the shadow while having the background lit up. So it's high key lighting, but they're silhouette, making the character a silhouette where you can't really see their expression. You can't really see them, but you can see the background behind them. Um, other ones have just the character lit up while the background's very dark. And then you have all sorts of ones in between and different color temperatures and everything like that. So it's just something interesting to look at while you kind of grasp the how different everything can be just from a few simple changes. Does anybody have any questions or comments on them? Um, mood, setting the mood with lighting. I don't think so. All right, so. I keep trying to remember like while we were watching um, because I always try to save the main questions, the main questions for the actual meeting, but I always end up asking you. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Maybe no. I mean, it's good to like save them for the meeting in case that's also someone else's question. But yeah, I really need to remember to do that. Yeah. Um. All right. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is stylistic versus realistic lighting. This is just very brief, very short, but it's just kind of talking about how when you are lighting something. You can go with the, this is kind of a tiny picture and I can't really make it larger. So sorry about that, but you can kind of see the difference between the realistic and the stylistic choice this, this guy made. On the left side, he's making it look real. Like you might walk into a room and it might look like that. And then the stylistic choice is on the right where you probably won't really see that unless somebody intentionally sets up a room like that. You generally won't see that kind of lighting style um, in any general computer room. And that's really what it comes down to when realistic is motivated and stylistic lighting is not motivated. So motivated meaning like by you have indoor lights, you have outdoor light like the sun or, or light leaking in through windows, doorways, things like that. You have lamps, fire, all of those things. You can motivate your light show that something is in the in the room and then you motivate the light by enhancing it with artificial light while stylistic light so sorry so motivated light is supposed to be like coming from something natural that or something that we would see every day like a regular household light unmotivated light or not motivated i guess stylistic lighting is more just like 
light and color seeming to come from nowhere. There's no real rhyme or reason for it. It's just there because it, it makes the image look cool. It's more artistic in a way, and it can, it looks more like an, a stylistic painting or a kind of music video, while the realistic looks more grounded and, and grounded in reality and how we would actually see something in real life, like I was saying. Um, this is just a comparison they were showing when I was looking at trying to get some uh, pictures of this. They showed this video game where they were, the, the older ones were doing more realistic lighting. And as the games went on, they kind of changed it to a little bit more stylistic by giving it more different hues or different color contrasts and things like that. And then the last one is just a scene showing like how a bar scene, you can make it be realistic. You could light it and have it kind of have some haze and make it seem kind of smoky in there. Like people are smoking and drinking and whatever and have the colors seem kind of natural. Or on the bottom, you could do something more like um, like that, more stylistic, more, more uh, kind of like a jazz bar or something like you might see in a concert. Um, and it just really depends on, on how you want to go about doing it. But again, it should be based on the story and, and what kind of story you're trying to tell and what kind of feeling you're trying to get. Yeah, it does look like a nightclub on the bottom. But yeah, that was mainly, that was it. I thought there'd be more to this, but when we were looking at it, when I was looking into it, um, that's pretty much all they said. It's just realistic lighting is, is supposed to be motivated from something. You see this light in the background up top left, that light's giving her that backlight. Then there's a window light over to the right that you can't see off screen. That's supposed to be giving the light going on to her, um, her face. And that's where all those lights are coming from. And the color of them are based on how the outside would look and how that light in the on the inside would look that kind of yellowish orange hue and that's why the whole scene is kind of lit up that way and the other one is just showing how the light's not really doesn't really matter where it's coming from exactly it just um it's just there to make the scene look that way um so it's not motivated by anything does anyone have any questions or comments on that All right, so um, kind of going off of the stylistic choice is color contrast. So this will, you'll see this in a lot of different films. Color contrast is when you are using different colors and different parts of the shot to either emphasize different things or to draw the viewer's eye to certain parts of the frame um, by using different colors so that they're not blending in together, they're contrasting against each other. And um, we'll get into that in a second. First, let's look at this color wheel. And they say, um, colors that are directly opposite of one another on the color wheel have the highest contrast available. So if you look at one of these color wheels, you'll see the colors like red and green. If you grabbed red and you made your subject have a little bit of a red hue and you make the background have a green hue, those are considered high contrast colors. So your color contrast will be very high. The background will be green, but the subject will be red. And so the subject will pop out of the green and it'll be easy to um, tell them apart. It'll be, you know, you'll be able to draw the viewer's eye to your subject immediately because they're a different color. And because green is on the complete opposite side of this color wheel, they, they should kind of blend well together, um, contrast well together, I mean, but also, they won't be anywhere similar to each other, so they won't blend into each other, if that makes sense, if I'm explaining it right. Most time you'll see things like blue and orange or, or teal and, and teal and the kind of orange, and we'll, sh I'll show you some um, images of that, but those are like the ones that are most often found in films. But you could also do anything else like red and orange. Red and orange is still color contrast, but it just has a very low contrast because they're right next to each other on this color wheel. So it'd be the same thing with like purples and blues, green and blue, uh, green and yellow, orange and yellow. All those are, are closer together, so they don't have as much of a color contrast. 
but they can still have you, you can still use them artistically and creatively to um, convey a different emotion and to still contrast your subject against the background if that's what you're trying to do. So in this image, we have the, one of the main um, things about the orange and blue the, or the teal and, and um, orange contrast is that our lights already make those colors. Like I was saying earlier, the, the daylight lights, if you're setting your camera for, um, for the orange, for the, uh, what is it called, tungsten light, then the daylight will look a lot more blue. And if you set it for the daylight, then the tungsten is gonna look a lot more orange. And because of this, these two lights, these two um, colors, whenever people are trying to do color contrast, these two are most often used because you can just shine a tungsten light on somebody and a daylight light on the background, or you can shine a daylight light like this image shows. They're shooting a daylight light on her, and then a tungsten light on the background and the foreground on these cups. And when they set their camera to the whatever uh, white balance they're trying to go for, they get this image where she's a little bit more blue. She's kind of contrasted against that background. That background's a lot more orange and, and a little bit red on that top left. Um, and then the, the cups are also having a little bit of an orange hue. So she really stands out compared to the rest of this, but they kind of all blend together pretty well. Um, and that's the reason you'll find a lot of movies and stuff have these, these two colors mainly, because you'll just find them in regular lights. You don't have to really do anything extra except for set your camera to a certain white balance to achieve whatever kind of look you want, um, because you can set it to make it more orange or you can set it to make it more blue, depending on what you want to go for. Uh, Raphael said, I saw in the videos that it's important to set white balance according to what we want in terms of color. Yes, because um, like I was saying, if you if you were to take, there's an automatic white balance feature on your camera, or there's a, you can like manually set a white balance feature where you hold up something white to the camera and tell it what white is. <clears throat> but if you're trying to have your subject actually have a colored hue on them, you don't generally want to do that because whatever you set that to, it's going to change the subject to um like right they're going to look normal they're not going to have an, a blue hue they're going to look normal but the rest of your scene is going to look extra orange because the camera is adjusting for that blue tint and you're telling it you you basically you'd give the the subject something white to hold and it would have a little bit of a blue tint in the camera and then you tell the camera that's supposed to be white so it adjusts everything in frame so that that thing is white so now that blue is no longer blue it's white, but that means that the orange or the little bit of orange in the background is gonna be much, much deeper orange. It's gonna be a lot more colored um, and vice versa. If you put the paper or the whatever you're using to white balance the gray card or whatever, if you're putting it on the background and you tell the camera, this is what white is, it's gonna to adjust to make all the orange parts look white or look natural, but it's going to make the subject look very dark blue and a lot deeper blue. So when you're trying to actually get a color on something or somebody, you don't wanna really use your white balance. You wanna adjust it on your camera manually. And that way you can pick how deep you want those blues, how deep you want those oranges or whatever color contrast you're using, because those are going to um, really affect how that color comes out and how much, how much uh, of a hue they have. Um, let me see. Oh, also, these are most used because, do I have another picture of it? Yeah. So they have her in daylight on the left, and the background is tungsten, that warmer light. And that's usually also why this, this um, color contrast variation is used so much, because outside we actually have daylight, and indoors, normally you'll have these oranger lights, these tungsten lights. Um, if you have any household lights, they're usually a little bit more orange just to have a more warm, inviting feeling. 
And so that's another reason why these are used so much is because we see this naturally. If you go outside, usually everyone's skin tone, no matter what skin tone you have, your skin tone's a little bit more of a warmer tint and the sky is blue, the ocean is blue. So we have the sand is a little bit more orange, yellowy orange, um, and the you know, and that's contrasted against the ocean, which is blue. So we see all these colors naturally when we go outside or when we go inside and see the window light pouring in. And that's why another reason why filmmakers choose these two colors so often is because they're the most natural to what we already have and they're the most easily accessible because of how our lights work, what colors they give off already. Um, film lights, I mean, not, not always regular lights. Yes, film lights are either gonna be daylight or tungsten light or interchangeable if you have some kind of LED light that can change back and forth. Mixing color can add a lot of depth to a shot as well. Um, you can see on this right, no, actually that's not a very good uh, example. Here's one. So you can see like she has a little bit, uh, they give you even the, the color palette at the bottom. So if you ever have somebody freezes a frame and they're picking out all the colors of the scene, that'll be that scenes, that shots color palette. Um, that brown and that light tan are coming from the right side of her hair or her skin tone. <clears throat> and then you have those greens all around the scene and the reds and blacks all around the scene as well. And so those colors are what's coming out of this scene, this shot. And you can see how much depth it adds to the room because of all the contrasted colors. You have the green on the red, and then you have the red on the green, and you have him in front of it excuse me, you have him in front of the red, he's green, you have her red on each side of her, she's green, and in the middle of those two reds, you have green. And because of all that, it's adding a lot of depth, it's adding a lot of variation and interest to the image. Instead of just leaving it kind of normal and how it would normally look, it might look a little boring or a little dull. Um, so color can really add some visual interest to your scene as well. Now, when thinking about color contrast, another thing that comes into play is wardrobe. Something like this, if she was wearing green, she'd kind of blend into the whole scene because the rest of the scene's pretty green. Um, even the water, because of how they graded it, it's looking a little green because it's reflecting all the trees and everything. So they put her in red so that she really stands out. And they didn't even, you know, they didn't make her skin tone look red. They just have her stand out with her wardrobe. So wardrobe's another thing to keep in mind when you're trying to contrast your subject to the background. And they said what a lot of indie films will do is they'll just put them in whatever. They'll show up and, you know, just show up in normal clothes that you'd normally wear. You don't really want to, want, <clears throat> but you don't really want to do that um, because you want your subject to, generally speaking, you want your subject to stand apart from the background. You want them to be noticeable. Um, they can still wear something normal, a red dress that's not, abnormal, it's just um, going to have her stand apart from the background they're shooting in. So similarly, if you have someone walking down the street, if they're wearing grays and blacks, they're kind of kind of blend into the street, they're gonna blend into the buildings because most buildings are kind of like a tan or black or something like that, white. So those colors will be, the, your subject will be, um, they'll, they'll blend into the background a little bit more than if they're wearing just maybe like a yellow or a green or a blue. And um, that can really affect how the image feels, how it looks and how, how much your subject stands apart from the rest. If you find movies that have a big crowd, usually you'll see that the main subject, typically speaking, is in a different color from almost everyone else. And that's just so that they stand apart. So we can quickly notice them, quickly see them, and uh, quickly pick them out of the crowd. Here's another just red and green contrast showing you how it can just add a little bit of depth to the scene. Um, you have the little pig in green and the little lamp, and then you have the red in the back on the wall. She's laying on a green pillow. 
and um, she has a little bit of a warmer hue to her, a little bit of orange that's motivated from that lamplight. So all these things added together, add a little bit of a visual interest and if everything was just tan and white like we're used to seeing in real life. Another one you'll see a lot is blues and reds. Um, you know, it's a movie like, like John Wick, they use blue and red a lot. And a lot of futuristic movies will also use it because they have red signs and blue streets and whatever else. So those two colors will get mixed a lot and they can look kind of, to me, it looks kind of like a 3D look just because I'm used to that blue and red. Um, but it does give a, a high contrast compared to everything else in the background when you have him his rim light is in red and the background is kind of a little bit more of a bluish purple. He really stands apart. We can really tell um, him from the background. He doesn't really blend into it as much. There's another one with the blues and reds where you have her in daylight. So she's a little bit more of that blue hue, but they set the white balance to match. So um, her skin tone looks natural. It doesn't look like it's blue, but you can see in the background, they didn't set it for this guy. There's that blue light above her in the back that probably has a lot more of a, it probably has more gels and stuff like that to make it more blue. And they're shining that down so that there's that blue hue all over the background and on the piano and on that guy. Um, and they're setting it for her. And then they have that red curtain in the background. So all those things are contrasting against each other, really making her stand out. Um, and also it's making him kind of fade into the shadow because um, blue's a little bit closer to that darker hue of just like a regular shadow. So it doesn't always have to be that your subject is lit up and colored and, and you know unnatural looking. It can also just be a natural daylight or a tungsten light on your subject and you white balance for that, making their skin tone look natural. And then you color the background to make them stand apart. Or you can do the opposite, I guess. You could also make them, not in this picture, but you can make them be colored, like her have red hue and then the rest of the scene look natural and that'll really make her stand apart as well. Green and, and blue, this is more of a low contrast look um, because they kind of blend in together. You can see he, he does blend into the background a bit more, but it doesn't, not too much. He's wearing a bit of a darker green, darker blue than the background is. Background's a little bit lighter. And so even just slight adjustments of color um, can have your subject stand apart depending on how you do it. You just wanna kind of make sure you know what you're doing when you know what you're looking for before you shoot. that you know what you want it to look for. Because uh, one of the things you can do in editing is you can enhance the colors in color grading. But um, the editor that was talking about it that we were reading about, he said the main thing you want to do is get those colors as close to what you want as possible on set so that all he has to do is enhance it. Because if there aren't that, that color palette doesn't exist in the scene when you shoot it, it's gonna be nearly impossible, if not impossible, to create exactly what you were looking for in post. You can't really create color from nothing. He used the example of saying, if you shot in black and white, you came to him wanting it all in color, it's not really gonna be possible. I mean, unless you spend hundreds of hours on every single part of it, and it still won't look the most natural. So he was saying, just try to get it right on set, try to think about your wardrobe, during where you're, like we were just talking about, before you get to your location, if you know where you're shooting, if you know what it's gonna look like a bit, try to get them to wear something that, if you want them to blend into the background because of the story, they're supposed to be a loser and nobody cares about them or something like that, then blending in is perfect. And it probably helps enhance the story of, of nobody's noticing them. But if you want them to really stand out for your audience or for the story, um, then, giving them something that doesn't look like everything else around that area of the shot is gonna make them stand apart a lot more than having them wear just whatever that general colors that look similar to everything you'd see out in the street or wherever you're shooting. So using things like those um, LED RGB lights that can change different colors, um, 
using different colored lights. Like if you don't have those using tungsten or daylight lights. And if you don't have that, if you have a light, you can still use something called gels. Which let me look it up just so I show you guys. You use something like this, color gels, which are just these little thin transparent pieces of plastic or I think it's just some kind of plastic. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but um, and you just put those over your lights and that can change the color temperature of the light. So if you have a tungsten light and that's all you have, you can use blue, um, blue pieces of paper like this, not paper, sorry, blue gels like this to change it to daylight. And vice versa, if all you have is a daylight light, you can put an orange gel over it and give it more of a tungsten look. Um, so that's also something you can do to give off these different looks. You can have one light. That's usually what they're doing, um, especially in that picture we saw, I believe in this one. I'm pretty sure they're using a gel over the light that they're shining on his back, his rim light. That's giving him that halo of red light. So they're putting a gel over that or that RGB light LED that they're changing to red so that it gives off that hue. And then in editing, they just enhance it, making it more red so it pops out a little more. No, gels aren't expensive um, at all, Rafael. They're pretty cheap, depending on which ones you get. Now, I'm not really, I'm not too sure like how much the expensive one should be. I've heard like party gels are a little bit thicker. One thing to keep in mind with gels is because it's something in front of the light, it is going to take away some of that, um, some of the light. It's going to, it's going to, what is it called? It's going to take away like a stop or two of light, depending on how thick it is, but it's going to also change that color tint. So if you have a light that can go brighter or darker, you shouldn't be, have a problem. But if you have a light that's only one brightness, then um, just be aware that the thicker it is, it's going to change how much light gets through. Let me see. Well, that wasn't what I wanted. I guess it just depends on the brand and everything. Um, but the ones I got, they're only like 30 bucks. And I think they go up to like 150 for some more expensive ones. But um, really, even people were using just, um, what is it called? Honey, you remember what they were using? It was like some kind of paper. Um, I, I remember they had like a thicker gel, but it was different. Yeah, um, that was the party gel, she said. I don't, I don't see anything for that. But there was like, they were using some kind of paper in one of the videos. They showed like a cheap option pretty much. Where if you don't have the gels, you could use. You actually use paper that you get like at the dollar store or at Party mm -hmm. Central or something, like just colored paper, kind of like what they did with the green screen, um, where they didn't have a green screen and they use like just green paper. Of course, it's not going to give the exact same effect, but they kind of used it as a um, not a is it diffuser or bounce bounce light i don't remember the few it would diffuse it if you're shining it yeah through. they kind of used it as a diff as a diffuser to give sort of like the hue of that color yeah, yeah the so there's like the dollar tree stuff that you can get too if you don't have enough money to go out and actually get the actual gels but, but i'm pretty sure you gels are not that expensive and you can get them on deals like all the time um, yeah they're not they're not that bad depending on where you get them from like like I said, I don't know the exact, like, I'm sure there's, you know, some brands that are, I don't Rosco, look into it too much. Go ahead. Roscoe Rosco is uh, one of the brands. Yeah. I think there's another one. Uh, there's a Chinese brand also can't remember the name, but Roscoe is uh, a brand which makes, uh, you know, the orange and blue gels, the CTOs and CTVs, I guess. Okay. And you can see right here, there'd be like, they have that whole, all those rolls. That's Roscoe right there. And it's about $155 for, um, I don't know, it's quite a bit of different colors. So of yeah. course, if you go down, it looks like it's about $5 for one. So it just depends on what you get. Um, Rafael. Not expensive, not much expensive, not that expensive. Not as expensive as some of the other stuff you can get, yeah. 
some of the other stuff. <laughs> I just found a cheaper option. What? Uh, wait, can I share my camera? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, no. I'll, stop. I'll stop sharing mine. Um, one what? second. I have to. What? Come on. Well, I'm trying to. Yeah, all right. You can go ahead oh, and share your camera. I have a, a, a um, binder divider. Like, it's just, it goes into a binder and it divides. But it oh, yeah. kind of works changing the light yeah and that's that's exactly what we're saying like you can change it it won't have off the same look the only thing i would say about using things like that or the paper is just um fire hazard make sure that it's yeah. far away enough from the light that it's not going to cause a problem especially with paper you know if you're putting it near a light those lights can some lights can get really hot uh and that can cause a huge problem so even with gels, but I think the more professional gels, they're supposed to have a little bit more heat resistance. Um, but yeah, exactly. Like you can always come up with different ideas and different cheap options to, to create the same kind of feel. It might not look exactly the same, but it'll get the same, um, the same kind of concept will come across as well still. All right, and then you have, you know, like orange and reds, which are also close together on the color wheel. So that's another low color contrast, um, but it can look well together depending on how you're doing it. Uh, I said more stylistic, like this is kind of an extension of stylistic lighting because a lot of these are a little bit more stylistic stuff you wouldn't really see in real life, but um, give off a, a certain feel and a very good, unique look for each film and each shot you're doing. There's another example of orange and reds and kind of like yellow and how they can all work together. Make a scene still look good, but it has that close color contrast that has enough of a contrast to how your um, subject can still pop out from the background, just not as much. Especially top left, I'd say he's in yellow, the rest of them are in red. I don't know if that's throughout the entire thing or if that's um, all of them, but that just shows me right there, he pops out compared to everyone else our main subject. So looking back at this color wheel again, red and green are on opposite sides, blue and orange. Um, then you have like the red, orange and blue, green. You'll find those like teal and the uh, reddish orange. Those go together. Usually what people will do is they'll take the opposite sides of the wheel and they'll put them together since they're supposed to complement each other pretty well and also um, contrast each other a lot. But any combination is, is fine. You just have to um, kind of test it to make sure you, that's what you want. That's how you want it to look. Seeing like the, the blue and the orange again, where the car's blue, they're a little bit more warm. The background on the, on the uh, I guess that's fields or maybe desert orange and then the sky is blue so you have that teal and um, orange contrast again you have the dark blues and the orange contrast and then you have a little bit of a lighter yellowish orange in the back on that light and those are all contrasting against each other and that's also providing a light a reason for him to have a backlight the one on the light on the right <clears throat> because it's shining onto his back and they're probably using some kind of film light to actually have it hit him since those lights are probably not powerful enough to actually do that. But a lot of movies, like I said, they use oranges and blues. Uh, more, that's the most common one. Just because, like I said, it's realistic and I, everyone loves it. So if you use a bunch of different colors though, you can still make something yeah, really- Yeah, they live in a little too much. I agree. I think it, I think it's a little bit overused, but that's just my pre, my uh, personal opinion on it. Um, yeah, I think everyone has their, uh, you know, things that it like. This is all subjective. So at the yeah. end of the day, something that I prefer will not be something that another person prefers. People might love it. I just think it's a little overused, and 
it kind of takes me out of it, especially when it's too oversaturated. But that's just my preference. So using a bunch of different colors, you don't always have to just use two color contrasted um, light sources. Something like this can also work. Even half of his face, more orange and more in the blues than the rest. And then you have oranges, blues, purples, reds, all sorts of colors coming from the background. And that's really making a unique, distinct look. And it's also having it kind of pop hey, out. Is that from Crazy Stupid Love? I maybe I don't, I don't really know I think so but I'm not sure I watched that movie with your mother the other day and it looks familiar <laughs> it probably is from that man because he was always in bars but um yeah but yeah something like that can really stand out um and do the same thing it's color contrasting he is contrasted against the background his orange side if you look at the picture you can see that the blue side of his face the side on the right which they're kind of white balancing for so it looks a little more natural um that is against that orange in the background and so that way he contrasts against the orange there's also the blue but there's no orange on his his right side which is our screen left um, and that's where the orange light on his face is coming from so that way he contrasts against the light on that side as well that's also something you can think about when you're um, setting up your shots and your composition you want your subject to stand apart most of the time and doing, if you want to do something like this where they have like a split look, um, it doesn't have to be orange and blue, it can be whatever. But if you have the background with those same colors, you can put the colors on opposite sides so that the subject stands apart on both ends. The orange side stands apart from that blue side, the blue side stands apart from that orange side, and it really helps us pay attention to him more than anything else. And as you can see, movie posters especially love this orange and teal <laughs> look. A bunch and a bunch of them that do this look. And if you look anywhere for it, you'll start seeing it everywhere. Um, if you look for it in films, you'll see it all over the place. This is just the main one that's used. Um, and it's everywhere. Wardrobe, lights setting, background, even practical lights. Those are all gonna have an effect on the color contrast or even the general color saturation. So if you're trying to do something like that, just think about all that stuff before you get to set. Talk about it if you have a separate editor. Talk about it with them. Make sure that they work with you. To, they'll, they'll, they want to work with you. If you have a separate editor, they always want to have the easiest work. So if you don't bring them something that has those colors in it already, it's going to be really hard or impossible for them to get them to come out of that image. So they want you to get it right on set so that they can just enhance it and make it look even better when it gets to editing. Um, and so when you're thinking about doing different shots like this, you want to make sure that you have an idea of it in your head and you're communicating that idea out to everyone else, your production designer. They're gonna be bringing props and setting up the design of the set. They need to know what colors you want. They need to know how what the look is. Your cinematographer, what are you looking for? What kind of camera setting should he set that white balance to? Um, your costume department, if you have one, or your actors, if you're just gonna tell them what to bring to wear, what, sh what should they wear to stand apart or what should they stare what should they wear to blend in, depending on what you're going for? Think about the wardrobe. And then think about what kind of lights the gaffer or the DP needs to bring, depending on who's lighting your scene. Um, what kind of lights you want, where you want them. All of these things are going to make a huge effect on all these color contrasts and the overall feel of the film. And uh, really unique looks can, get, can be done. Really professional and cinematic looks can be done from cheap lights and using things like Raphael was showing just like a, a binder, uh, whatever, you a break, what do you call it? That mid- uh, Divider. Divider, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Using something like that, just coming up with solutions when you don't have enough resources, you can still make something look amazing and it doesn't have to look dull and boring just because you don't have the professional equipment. So don't limit yourself 
just because you have limited equipment, you can still do something really cool and unique. Oh, last thing to be aware of when you're trying to go for color contrast or you're trying to go for certain colors in your film. If you are shooting outside and you're gonna use something like those ND filters, um, let me just show that again. Those ND filters, which are pretty much just sunglasses for your camera, darken the image because you might have to expose it differently to make sure that it matches your subject to the background. One's not super white and blown out or one's not completely in the shadow. Um, so you use ND filters sometimes to kind of match the light so that everything is exposed well. And these can sometimes have color cast or color spill. Uh, I don't know if this is actually realistic, but I've heard sometimes they give a little bit of a orange hue or they can give, they can make shadows look kind of magenta, kind of like that. Um, and so you don't really want that because you can't really fix it in post. It, it's hard to get out. It's hard to get right. Um, so just pay attention to that. If you're going to use anything like that, if you're going to be shooting outside, doing tests, doing pre-work, looking up what you want, you want to make sure you're doing all these things like, you know, the wardrobe and all that. But once you get down to it, you want to make sure that the all those months of planning and thinking about it aren't going to go to waste by having to use certain tools that you didn't even think about. So things like ND filters or any other kind of filter that you had to put in front of the lights or the camera might affect the light cast or light hue and might change it and shift it a little bit more than you thought it would or bring in unnecessary um, unwanted colors. So you want to do tests and make sure that the stuff you're going to use, the kit you're going to use is going to be, it's going to work. And if you come into that problem, you want to know it early on so that you can get over it. Um, you, not over it, not, not get over, it, but get, um, you can get over the hurdle and you can still get what you want in the end. That's what I mean. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Color contrast. Also the, the camera has uh, the in the uh, stops also, right? So I think you need to compensate for if you use any uh, ND filters outside, uh, so you'll have that better control. Uh, I don't know, most of the uh, expensive cameras have more stops. Maybe you can talk about the camera that you have, uh, Lakota. The, the yeah, stops. the Canon C300, and it actually comes, um, the Mark One, and it actually comes with built-in ND filters. So it has like three stops of filters. You can also just turn down or up the ISO to brighten it or, or lower the uh, brightness. And um, and then, you know, there's the whole thing with aperture, closing it down and opening it up to let in more or less light. Um, oh, so wow. some of these movies are older too. So they've been using it forever. Oh yeah, this has been in forever. Color yeah. contrast, just different ones have, have been for everything. No, I know, but especially the uh, the the blue and orange thing. I thought that was a, new, a recent development, but looks like they've been using them for a while too. Yeah, no. They, if you look at any movie posters, like this is usually what it is. Some a lot of uh, I think the expensive cameras like the Red or uh, the Ari. Uh, they have like 15 stops, right? Somewhere around there. 10 stops, 15 stops. We can have much more control of them. Are you talking about like the color, the dynamic range? Yeah, the indie stops, sorry. Indie stops. Oh, okay. The different tools. Oh, okay, nice. So they have like a lot. More. Mine only has, th mine has three. I don't think it's three stops, but it's, once you add them all together, I think it's like eight. Because I think it's like half and then it's like, I don't know. I don't know the exact amounts, but I know like mine has three different variations of how dark it can get. And if you add all those stops together, I think it's like six to eight stops of light that's um, getting blocked. And I think uh, you can add, uh, you know, the ND filters in front of the uh, camera lens also to uh, increase those stops, you know, if you have to. So you can, yeah, I guess that flexibility is there, right? Yeah. For the camera also. Yeah. 
And uh, but if you are doing any of that, if I were to use all three of my um, ND filters built into my camera, and then I was also going to use an ND filter for my lens, um, I would just want to test it beforehand in an outdoor environment that's similar to the scene. If I don't know where I'm shooting, I should at least know the time of day that I plan to shoot or the kind of look I want. And then um, just kind of test it and make sure that it's not going, that it looks similar to what I want or that I'm able to get those colors that I want. If I'm trying to give the person either a blue or orange tint or something like that, I can still get that even with all those indie filters on. So yeah, just always do the testing, testing out everything because I've seen uh, people all use these tools can change. Hmm? I've uh, seen people use uh, le you know the the filters uh, with color uh, tint on it. It looks pretty, actually, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, very clean, you know. Look, it has uh, mm -hmm. changed the color temperature of the whole scene, except. Uh, it does it for the whole scene. It doesn't do for selected spots like you would have with the lights. So. Right. I think it's kind of like ND filters, right? It's just, a, I don't know what they're called, but I know it, they're kind of like the sunglasses that change the color of everything to orange, if you ever saw the sunglasses, mm -hmm. um, but they're for your camera. And so they have the different colors, like like he's saying is uh, you can change like purple or green and they have all sorts of colors that you can put on the lens. It's just little sheets of either glass um that have a colored tint uh but that like you said they change the whole scene so if you're trying to do like two colors contrasting on each other it does make it a bit harder you just have to up if you're like if you're doing um orange and blue and you're putting an orange glass filter on your lens then the whole scene's going to look a bit more orange you just have to make sure that the color um the this the light that's going to make the scene blue, the light that's going to make the parts of the scene blue that you want are just a little bit extra blue. That way they counteract that orange that you've added into the, to the uh, image. That makes sense. It's kind of the same thing about like changing the white balance on your camera. The more you change it, the more orange or blue the parts are going to look. So if you want to set it to uh, Matt Damon's face in this middle picture, and he's a bit more orange, then you're just gonna have to add more blue hue on him, or you're gonna have to add more blue or turn take down the orange a bit so that um, the orange parts of the scene don't get too too saturated with orange a uh, hue. Because the once you set it to his face and say make him look natural, the rest of the scene's gonna get affected by the camera because it's gonna change all the colors to make sure his colors look natural. And like skin tone. I don't know. She so she so said. I don't know why all action movie posters look the same. It's probably because of these color contrasts, honestly. Because I mean, if you look at them, they don't really look the same. There's quite a bit of difference, but it's just mainly this color that is really affecting like the overall image. Oh, I don't mean like exactly what they're saying. I meant like they kind of, the way they frame the posters all feel the same, like someone just standing in the forefront with a bunch, like, I don't know how to describe it. Like, like, like I don't know, maybe they have someone looking away from the camera or maybe they have like, like, I can't count how many posters like Avatar I see where like they have two big um faces like kind of in the, like right there in the front. Like, yeah. <laughs> or like some of them like Avatar where they have the character and they're looking away from the camera, like they're back to the camera. Like like they don't look exactly the same, but I feel like they kind of follow the same way of framing how they frame the characters in the poster. Yeah. Like I don't know, they all feel like I've seen it feels like I've seen them all before, even though they look very, very different. I don't know how to describe it. Yeah, I agree. It's just yeah, no, I agree. I think I think it's a combination of different things, but they they do tend to always have like the actor either looking directly at camera or right off like in Born Identity, or flight plan right there where she's just kind of barely looking off camera, and then they have the rest of the scene in the background. Or Avatar, like you said, which is two faces. Avatar: the Last Airbender up there, where it's just like two contrasted people looking away. And the amount, also the amount of posters that's just the main character looking in a stance, like the aliens poster, and like I've seen a million posters like that. Oh, the Dark Knight looks similar. 
um it's just it's very interesting it's either them looking sideways or the um like their faces or it's them like standing in a menacing pose <laughs> <laughs> yeah well there's only so many things you can do on a movie poster i feel like yeah, that's without true. giving too much away and you know it's a hard job does anyone have any questions or comments about color contrast or any other ones so is this like i feel like i already mentioned this so is this kind of like what the opposite of what like marvel movies do with like the colors kind of, I don't know if this is the right word, like they seem saturated, like the colors would seem really dull. Um, this, not necessarily. So that's more about like how saturated you want to make. Like this one on the left, I don't think that's very saturated, um, but it still has her in daylight and the background tungsten. So she's a little bit more white. Well, they said it yeah, for her. Another, another mistake, uh, another thing that was um, said in one of the videos that is, um, that was actually quote unquote wrong, um, not wrong, but like not necessarily the, nor the rule was he was talking about how color contrast, it needed to be like on opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, and that's not necessarily like, yes, that's one way to do it. That's not the only way to do it um sometimes it can just be with very bright colors versus very dark colors um sometimes it can be colors that are like red and orange that are like side by side in the color wheel but they they can contrast each other so that's not necessarily a like has to be that to be color contrast so that was another thing that we heard like once or twice and that went against the majority of um books filmmakers schools stuff that you you learn so that's also something to keep in mind you don't have to follow a specific um way like it has to be oversaturated with like this or like that or to to be that i don't know right. if i'm explaining it right like i said i'm not great at remembering no, all the right. terms oh, i was okay. going to add to that that um so like in something like this you know it's a lot it's very red there's, you know, there's orange on the lights, but it's, it's extremely red. So it's very saturated with the red hue and something like this, it is blue and green, but it's mostly just his clothings are, are a little bit saturated. The background is a little bit more just like a gray kind of green. Um, I don't really know what color that would be, but it's not it's more like a greenish gray. Huh? From the looks of it, like it's a greenish gray more than anything. Yeah, that's what I Because if you look at, green. yeah, because if you look at the uh, the color spectrum down there, it's kind of like that. So this one on the bottom right, swamp the sky is green. Like this one. Yeah. Um, um, so he is still, I think it's you know, teal. He still looks natural, but his clothes are I call a little it bit more saturated. <laughs> no, so the last one looks very swampy. It doesn't always have to be completely really dark, deep colors. Um, like I said, this one on the left, it's not as saturated as this one on the right. He's color contrasting blue with red on the right and blue with orange on the left. They've just set the white balance for her face. So now she looks a little bit more of a natural skin tone. Um, so she looks a little, like the light looks white and that's making this background light because it's more tungsten, so that warmer light is looking a little bit more orange. So it's still doing the same thing. It's still having a color contrast. It's just not as, saturated uh Raphael, to answer your question in the um in the chat because he was asking like well not asking but basically stating um but it has a question mark so i guess what the actor is wearing matters too so it doesn't contrast with the light you're putting on them uh very I'm mostly much so. just confused um about what like would it i uh... I'm wondering if it would matter like wardrobe would matter in like if you're trying to contrast or whatever um I guess well, if wardrobe the, is it's very the color important. That you're trying. So I, yeah. I'll go back to this picture for that. So if you wanted her not to stand out so much, you would be, you know, if you know you're going to shoot and it's going to be more of a green hue and you want her to stand out and you're going to set her skin tone to like natural skin tone color um, and you want to find a way for her to stand out from the rest because of this color wheel, 
and how green is opposite from red. So they're supposed to supposedly a, a very complementary to each other, even though they're high contrast because they're on opposite sides. Anything on opposite sides is considered to go well together. So that's why you'll see this blue with the orange. See, that's on the opposite side. You'll see yellow with purple. You'll see, you know, green with red. All of these you'll see a lot because they're on opposite sides of the color wheel and people say they look good together. Um, and those are the highest contrast you can have because they're on the opposite side. So, one so of the videos... going back to this, I would say if you didn't want her to stand out, her wardrobe is extremely important just because you want her to stand out. So they wanted her to be in a different color than the background. Background's green. If she wore green, she would blend in. They wanted her more. to be the thing that your eyes focus on first, the thing that stands out in the image. Um, one of the videos that I watched just for fun, a few of them actually, were exactly about wardrobe and the importance of wardrobe in telling a story and a narrative. Um, it's actually so much more important than people no, and it was just so interesting. Like I was just watching it for fun. I don't know if that's going to be in the syllabus or not. I was even going to ask Coda about it when it comes to like lighting and stuff, if I should add some to this to the playlist or whatever. But I was watching a few, and they were explaining how wardrobe helps you understand not only the personality of the character, but as far as lighting goes, it helps um, maintain focus on what should be main, like what your what your eye eye goes to first. It helps so the image bl like blends together in a nice cohesive way that helps um, like the story move along. Like for example, in that image that Coda had of the guy in the green gross looking place with the green vest. Um, not gross looking, just looks like it's raining. <laughs> but if you were wearing like a super bright ne a neon or, or like something it, it wouldn't be the same tone because if he's going for like a moodier if he was wearing something that was you know yellow and purple on that green background yeah. he would stand out like a, a lot happy... more than he does right now with his green and blue because the background's kind of green and blue and it would be a tonal inconsistency as well because he's wearing like super bright and happy tones and a super um depressing background and sometimes that's what you're going for but if it's not it just it doesn't lend well to the tone of the story, to the um, continuity and the overall theme, you know, message you're trying to tell. Yeah, so, wardrobe, yeah wardrobe is actually really important to um, conveying emotion because we kind of, and showing character because, you know, if they have grungy, dirty clothes that aren't well taken care of, you're gonna think you of that character really a lot differently than if they're in a really, nice um you know ironed out shirt or suit or whatever and it's very clean a simple very... a simple example or to be less extreme or i guess depending on your viewpoint would be um if there's a woman that um this was a big controversy it was a silly controversy but it was a big controversy that people were talking about the sex and the city reboot and they were saying that these women who were Upper East Side Manhattan women, super rich, like in their 50s, were wearing Forever 21 cheap outfits and that looked super hideous. And they're like, this doesn't match their character. This doesn't seem like the, per the person they are. And it doesn't match the place where they are either. So even if you see a woman wearing like a designer coat or a handbag, you're like, okay, she's, ri she's rich or she cares about her appearance a lot. Um, you know, you can, you can tell a lot from wardrobe, not to mention the effects that it has on lighting, that it can also affect lighting and mess with your lighting, which is why in the, in the production meeting yesterday, we were talking about how most people in production wear black for that exact reason, so that it, Coda can explain it better, but so that it doesn't bounce off Most people wear black so that they're not as distracting to the actors and also so that they're not bouncing any color back into the scene. Um, so the crew wears black because of that. Even in like theaters, you'll see that because they don't want to be noticeable. They don't want to be, you know, people paying attention to them. They want people paying attention to the subjects or the actors or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So um, wardrobe on all fronts is very important on lighting, on consistency, on story, on character. Yes. And just going to color, just because we're talking about color contrast. So it's just, it is important to kind of know what they're going to wear 
or what kind of scene you're looking for. You can see she's wearing something, I believe that's either white or light tan, and they're putting her to blue and putting the background to orange. So it doesn't necessarily mean that she needs to wear a blue dress for it to work. Um, she could be wearing a blue dress and she'd probably pop out from that background even more. I was going to say mean, that in my, for me, a dark blue dress would have even matched the uh, place more since it looks like an elegant, like a, a darker color for me in my, in my perspective would have looked better with the overall scene, like a darker color. Yeah. Um, just because it's a little too bright, um, it kind of clashes a little bit. Yeah, and see, and that's exactly, um, it's all subjective. So it's not like a hard and fast rule. It just, yeah. it doesn't, it's just something to be aware of so that if you don't want to go for that, you, um, you know, to tell them not to bring something like that, or, you know, to change your light or whatever you're going for, you just want to have as much information as you, as possible so that you can make the decision yourself on how you want. And to you can up. also, when communicating, because you will communicate with the costume department, if you are like a DP or, or a director, it does help to give the costume department an idea of this is what we're going for. This is the scene. This is, you know, the, the tone. It will help them know how to dress the character for the scene as well and for the lighting. Yeah, they usually give what's called a look, but I don't know if it's going to show up, but it's just kind of grabbing some scenes from different movies or some different visual styles and saying, this is kind of the tone I wanna go for in my movie. Um, and they, on bigger sets, sometimes smaller sets, but usually not as much, um, but they give out these things and say like, these are the kinds of things that I'm looking for in these shots and these, this film. Um, before they get into storyboarding and everything like that, they kind of just wanna give a sense of, of what they're going for, what kind of look they're, they're trying to achieve. And um, if it changes throughout the movie or if it's going to be the same and we want this movie to be a little bit more bright or this scene to be bright and this scene to be dark because this is when they break up or whatever's going on in the story, they'll usually have something like that and give that to um, production design, the design crew and um, a few the other departments and see the uh, so that everyone can kind of be on the same page of what kind of tone the uh, movie's going for. So yeah, this is what I mean by every department is crucial. Something that most people wouldn't think of is like wardrobe. Oh, it's just like, oh, they're probably just, oh, if the character's stylish, if the character's not, but it's so much more complex than that for lighting, for tone, for story, for everything. Yeah. Every aspect of the story. And just to go back to um, Chisum, your your question, it was like the about the saturation. So you can just see in like something like this, they're, you, they're both using green and reds to contrast each other. This one, they just have the subject in green light. And this one, they have her separated from the colors. So you don't have to stick to just two colors and it doesn't have to be super saturated. This looks like a normal room. Um, it's not as high saturation. It's just... There's, those two colors are still going to contrast against each other and she's still going to contrast against those colors because she is a little bit more of like an orange hue right now. Raphael, did you... Like this, it's a lot more saturated. They have the subject in green and so it's very, very high contrast um, and it's really just mainly greens and reds contrasting against each other. But depending on how um, colorful you want to make those, that's just your that's usually done in editing like the once you have the greens and the reds you can enhance them and make them darker red deeper red deeper green in editing but you just want to make sure when you're on set you have that green and red in the spots you want them so that when you get it to editing they can just enhance it and, and make it more colorful or less colorful depending on so how honey. saturated before we move on, uh, just to be clear, Raphael, Chisom, did you guys understand, like, get an answer to your question? Are you so confused about anything? Just because I know that, like, asking the question already takes sometimes, like, a little bit of courage, but then you might not understand it immediately, and you might be wanting to ask more, but just not sure. So 
if you guys still like have more questions or want to understand it better, it's okay to ask, you know, like we're learning together. Wait, so what you're saying when like when I was talking about like the Marvel movies, when I was talking about like you know that video where I was talking about how um how Marvel movies just look ugly. Um, I, think was... <laughs> I think I did watch that video. Yeah, I was basically saying how everything's gray and or like overly saturated or underly saturated or something like that. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was more under Yeah, basically how there's basically no color, and I didn't realize that until he actually. That's because they obviously never saw a Zack Snyder film because the gray in those films, goodness gracious, it's saturated but also gray, like everything's gray. It's amazing. Yeah, I think it's the, <laughs> the costumes look ugly because they're not colorful. I, don't know. I feel like with superhero costumes, uh, unless it's like Batman or something, it's like. I feel like it takes away from it when they do some black, They have to look campy. Gray looking garbage. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that's more about saturation levels once you get into editing. Um, well, shoot. <laughs> I'm trying to find like a image of it. Mm. Ow, mother. Ouch. Well, I don't know. I would say that's just how much color they're they're putting into it. Like in editing, you can up the colors and and make them even colorful, more colorful. Even in photos, if you take a picture with your phone, you can. I've seen a lot of Marvel movies, and I will something say like that this. there is it does vary very much from director to director. Yeah. Like I feel like. A lot of crap now. I, I know I'm terrible with names, but the guy that made the most, the Joss Whedon's, the Joss Whedon, I think it is, the one who made most of them, he has a very specific color palette for almost every single one of them. And it is very muted. And then when you look at the other direct, the other directors and cinematographers that came in, they've changed it up a little. Like Ragnarok is very colorful. Um, and so is Guardian of the Galaxy. Wasn't he Joe Sweden as well? I don't know. All I know is that each story had a different, um, a different take on the lighting as well. So at the end of the day, it's just a stylistic choice, like what they think will go best for the story. And sometimes they just want to focus more on the characters and not as much on being campy or colorful. And uh, in the in the early two thousands, especially, they wanted people to take superhero movies more seriously so they tried purposefully to make them either grittier or to just not make them too colorful so that people could focus more on the actual story and meeting the characters and take the movies more seriously oh, okay. so that could also play a part in it so just showing these images like it shows how once you have those colors in your scene you can enhance them and make them more and more colorful like obviously his skin tone probably isn't that orange but because he has a little bit of an orange hue and the sky has a blue hue and the ocean has a blue hue you can enhance that more and more in editing and create an image like that or you can leave it kind of muted and have it like the on the left as long as those colors are in the scene you can um affect them to your liking changing how saturated or desaturated it is the left would be very desaturated. There's not that much color. It's pretty gray. And then the right is, I think, overly saturated because it's very dark blue and his skin's very orange. Um, and so I would find somewhere in the middle if I were doing that picture, um, just personal preference. But like, it just shows like how you can, you can do, that's a bit more of like a, um, a little jump. It's not as, it's not as uh, crazy of a contrast. That beginning and his the one on the right that's afterward so it's a little bit li a little bit more colorful a little bit more saturated but not too much. Um, so Sorry, it just you were trying to say something. Yeah, no. Um, I was trying to. I, I was going to talk about um, like you could clearly see the difference when that that with that picture you just showed, but I was the other one, the one that said, um, step one, step two, step three. Like the guy was kind of looking at the sky. 
Uh, oh, like step one, step two, step three. Crap, where did it go? Oh, it was this one, and then it was this one. So this one? Yeah, I don't really see the difference between step two and step three. It looks exactly the same. Um, step three, his face is a bit more orange on his cheek and okay, his yeah, forehead. Yeah. Yeah. And the ocean behind him is a little bit more blue. The final steps from what um, from what we've noticed are just like little subtle things here and there. Like a lot of the videos in the syllabus, they see they will show like the base, the main image at first, like the super dark image, or just like one light, and then they will add um, the rim light. The rim light. Oh my gosh, tongue twister. The rim light and the and the key light, and they'll just like add the hair light and all these other little lights here and there, all these other little details that well, some will make a bigger difference. And then the, the more um, you go, the more it's like a tiny little difference here and there, just to add um, more uh, uh, contrast and spatial awareness and separation between the person and, and the um, so, background. Yeah, and again, like just for me, the personal preference I think two is good I would not take it further to step three I think that's too saturated but that's just again my preference and as you can see the colors are still there even in this one on the left that's very muted um, so he they're able to draw those colors out and enhance them in post then if he didn't um, if he wasn't in that location and he the water was actually gray let's say somewhere he found gray water then it would be a lot harder to get it to turn blue. You'd have to do a lot more um, like manual editing than just upping the saturation. So that's what we were meaning when we were talking about like their clothing, the setting of the scene and what you have in it, the different lights you put in it and the different colors of those lights are all gonna affect the colors within your scene. And that's gonna be able to be enhanced or desaturated later if that's what you want. Okay, I understand. thank you. Yeah. And also, I think uh, sometimes what happens is, uh, you know, you have that color chart that you take, uh, capture the color chart at the beginning of the scene. So, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, you know, the color, uh, the skin tone and uh, the wardrobe and the background uh, lighting uh, will affect the color in such a way that uh, when the editor is actually, or the color um, person who is doing the color correction, he would have no idea what the color palette uh, looked like with that light. So if he has that reference, then he can adjust the wardrobe. You know, wardrobe may look completely different in the scene, in, you know, with, you know, with uh, your naked eyes, but when you're actually looking at the video, it may be completely different. So he has some reference based on that. He can adjust the uh, specific uh, spots on the scene, whether it be you know, the skin tone or uh, the wardrobe or the background or maybe some objects, you know, uh, uh, the props on the set, which would uh, just pop out because you have some color reference. So I think uh, the color palette is kind of uh, crucial. If you're taking a scene, you just have a color palette right at the beginning. So it becomes a lot easier for the editor to do it in the post. That's are, you, are you not talking about this? You're talking about a color palette, not a color checker? Uh, yeah, this one here. Color check. Yeah, the color uh, checker. Checker. Oh, okay. Checker. Yeah. I was just making sure I got the right thing that you were talking about. Yeah. Checkerboard, I think. Any anything with respect to which has different colors in it. So you know, and they match that color with respect to what the wardrobe may be, uh, because these are pretty standardized uh, colors, and they are pretty uh, you know industry standard. They mm -hmm. they remain the same uh, throughout because the color uh, contrast or the, the light contrast that falls on that kind of makes it to a certain color temperature. And uh, you want to maintain that color temperature with respect to your clothing and everything else in the scene. So it becomes uh, crucial. Sometimes like if you're in a you know busy shooting and you can completely forget to, it's almost like uh, you, know, you have to have like a gradient. Uh, you know, in one of the pictures that you have here is a gradient. Mm -hmm. um, the color gradient, and then you have the black and white gradient. Uh, both of them are uh, crucial because one sets up how much uh, uh, contrast you have, another sets up what the color temperature is. So it's kind of both of them are uh, it's used in the post. The light charge is what's called? I uh, don't know. Is that what's called? 
brightness chart. I know what you're talking about. It has like gray, light, white, dark. Right, right. There's like Same. four color stocks. Yeah. I just don't know what the name of it is. Uh, maybe if I do film. No. Well, it's basically the same thing as the color checker. It just has, um, it has four stops. Oh, here we go, right here. So it's something like that in the middle where it has white, gray, darker gray, and then black. Right. And that's important for the uh, the brightness and just having a reference at the beginning of whatever shot you're doing. Yeah, that's right. There are a lot of uh, charts like this available. I guess you have to pick and choose what. Uh works best for you, but having something is a you know a lot better than not having anything at all. Right. So it kind of helps. And it helps the editing too, and it helps you know like what is going on in the scene as well. Does anyone have any questions or comments about um, color contrast or this color checker thing? All right, and move on to the last thing, which is just a little bit. There wasn't too much new information for this, but um, talking about filming in different rooms, I've kind of already gone over a lot of this. The main thing you want to do is just if it's a larger room, there's probably going to be more echo. And that's just because there's more walls, there's more space for the sound to travel around in. So you um, want to try to block it as best you can to make sure there's no echo or reverb that you don't want. Bare walls, bare floors, bare ceiling, and hardwood doors, they're all gonna have a lot of echo and reverb, cement, uh, cement I mean, and um, just like really hard surfaces. Those are any kind of hard surface, no matter where it is, it's gonna bounce a lot of sound back and forth between um, the room and that's gonna cause echo within the mic because of the way the mics pick up sound. So you can use things just like towels, regular blankets, house rugs, um, or what's called sound blankets. There's these things, there's like these big blankets that try to block sound. They have little holes in the top where you can hang them up on a wall and they're really thick so that they can um, absorb the sound and stop it from bouncing around everywhere. I said they're, um, really good and they said i don't remember how much they cost but the different brands and different things i don't know which one's the best or any of that but the one guy that I was talking about it said they're about 50 bucks 60 bucks each and they cover like um i don't know like a few like five feet across a wall so if you have a 10 foot wall it'd be like two blankets of that and it'd block that whole wall um and there's different sizes and everything like that so there's probably different price ranges for different brands and different sizes, but these are something that if you actually want something in your, you know, filming bag or whatever, wherever you're going to always have it with you. These are something you can have. They're pretty heavy though. So just, you have to make, keep that in mind. There are, he said he bought like three or four of them. They were 75 pounds for the whole thing. Um, so they are pretty thick. They are pretty heavy, but that's why they're so useful. They block that sound. They absorb it and stop it from going all over the place. But um, like I said, if you're filming somewhere that you have just available house things, just like regular towels or regular blankets, rugs and stuff like that, you can help stop the sound from bouncing around the room. As long as you're putting something in front of these hard surfaces, um, that's the main thing about blocking that echo, um, just because you're blocking the sound from, from bouncing back absorbing into something another thing they said that was good is i'm um, using something like books if you put books on a shelf it's not going to have as much um, reverb it's not going to have as much of an echo coming back at you because you're blocking that hard surface of the shelf and you're putting books on it and it looks natural so things like that just anything that can block it um any kind of item at all really will start to dampen the the um, echo that goes out throughout the room. If you ever notice when you move into a new house, it's very echoey when you clap or snap or talk, you hear a lot of reverb and a lot of echo. And then once you start bringing in the furniture, the bed, the 
dressers and whatever else into the bedroom or something like that, uh, it goes down a lot and you don't hear it as much at all. There's also the foam panels that they said you can use. They, those are a little bit more annoying. I know this for myself because they're all little and they're, they're not too thick, they're not too heavy. So they're actually, they don't stop. They stop sound pretty well, but they don't stop sound as much as something like those blankets or just a regular um, like rug or regular bed blanket would, would do because those are thicker materials. So they'd absorb more sound. Um, but these are good just for, because they're really lightweight and they're not, they're generally not too expensive. So they're easy to, to bring around. The only annoying thing about them is that they're all individual most of the time. They're just these individual squares like in this. And so you have to set them all up separately and you want to do it kind of like the design right here. One's facing up, one's facing sideways. That way, if there is any sound that hits them, they'll travel along those edges and hit against something else instead of continuously traveling throughout the whole room if you had all of them turned sideways because then they're eventually just going to bounce off the wall again. Um, so if you do want to get these, you just want to make sure you're doing that opposite pattern where one's sideways, one's up. But they are pretty annoying to, they do take some time to set up because there's so many of them and they're so little. They're just like about a, I'd say about a foot across each side. And so if you have a, a 10 foot wall by, and you know, it's like 10 feet off the ground, you're going to have to have, I don't even know how many hundred of them or something to cover the whole wall. So you just want to keep that in mind if you're trying to use something like that. Or especially if you're going to somebody's house, you have to stick them to the wall. Um, and you know, you don't want to damage anybody's property when you're using it. So that's also something to, to uh, keep in mind when you're trying to use something to block sound. Using things like blankets or other things like that and just hanging them up somewhere is going to be a lot less damaging to the location than um, using some kind of material to stick a bunch of different foam pieces all around because sometimes those can tear off pieces of you know the paint because paint's not really that um, sturdy. Sometimes it just, especially wall paint, it just chips off easily depending on what you put on it. So if you're using something like that, you just want to keep that in mind that it's going to be a little longer and it's going to, you're going to have to do, use something that's not going to damage the walls in whatever location you're using. Vice, now, uh, on the opposite end, if you're in a small room, it's going to have less echo just because there's less um, room for the sound to bounce off of and go back to. But things like equipment and computers and whatever else, they're going to make more noise because they don't have a lot of room to travel. So they are going to affect the recording a bit more um, in a smaller room because it's so contained especially depending on the size of the room, you might have the sound bounce off of everything in equal directions. And that means that it's just gonna be bouncing everywhere all at once. And then, so you're gonna hear it in the mic. It's gonna sound a lot different. Um, and because it has nowhere to go, it's all gonna be going into that mic eventually, depending on how loud those things are. And um, it might not seem that loud, but if you're in a small room, a computer will sound a lot louder than if you're in a, a big room. If your computer room is the living room, you don't notice it as much as you do if it's in your, you know, little bedroom or something like that. So that's something to keep in mind if you're in a small room recording. They're, they're not going to be as <clears throat> annoying for echo and everything, but they will be more annoying with every noise being more contained. And so any noise the crew makes, if they can fit, um, and if <laughs> any noise the lights make that you're using, those are going to affect your sound recording a bit more than they would in a larger room. So when you're filming in a new room, you just want to kind of go in and identify any problems. You might want to clap, see how much echo there is. Just do a little bit like here. If there's a reverb or an echo coming back into your um, ears and you can really hear that. And then you can start figuring out where those problems are coming from. I just clapped right now. I noticed it's coming from the ceiling. I have nothing covering my ceiling. If you guys have seen in my video, then I have those sound panels all over my walls. So it's not really coming from the walls as much. 
but the ceiling's bare and we have carpet, so it's not coming from the floor. Um, so if I really wanted to make it more damp, I would probably put something on the ceiling or put like a blanket over my head, put it on some kind of um, C stand or something and put it over my head. So I'm trapped in this little area where the sound's not gonna be bouncing around if I was just trying to record me and my voice. Uh, but of course, if you're shooting cinematography and you're shooting a scene, you just need to make sure that your stuff that you're uh, trying to block the sound with isn't gonna be in the scene. So that might not always be feasible to put a blanket over somebody's head, especially if you wanna show that part of the scene in the, in the shot. Um, so those are some things to just keep in mind. But as long as you can identify the problems, it's a lot easier to figure out ways to stop it from affecting your recording. So like if you find any devices, maybe there is a computer and maybe you're shooting in an office and they all have a lot of computers. You don't really need the computers to be turned on in your scene. So just turn them all off so they're not making noise. Um, lights, fluorescent lights might give off a buzzing noise. So you can turn those off and use your studio lights. And um, just anything like that. You always wanna identify problems early on. So that's what location scouting is really for. If you're able to go into that space before you shoot there, then it just makes it a lot easier to identify those kinds of things. Um, if they have hard floors and you don't have any carpet, just try to see if you can get something like we showed the other day, which is something like hush heels, which is little pads that go on somebody's the bottom of their shoes. That way it's not making that loud clank every time they walk. Um, and things like that. If you don't have to show the floor, you can even just put like a blanket or a carpet down. Or, or a rug or a towel. That way there's not stepping on that and making a lot of noise and there's not much sound bouncing off. So there's a lot of different things you can do as long as it's not needed in the shot. And if it is needed in the shot, there's a lot of things you can try to work around to make sure it doesn't affect the audio recording. Other than that, all the other things, well, this was a lot of the same information too, but. Other than that, the other information was exactly what we've already heard before. So if I don't really have any other notes that were new um, besides like the ones that we already went over before. That's true too. Uh, v said, we can walk around in socks if you can't see the feet. That's another option to not hear like the footprints, not footprints, to not hear the uh, footsteps. You could put, you know, put them in socks. Now, well, and, uh, I would just be careful that with that weren't... because it's a slipping hazard, but, um, oh, yeah. but it is an option, especially just to limit, limit from the someone who slipped in her own house many times. <laughs> the main thing with the hardwood floors isn't just about the footsteps too. It's just about blocking that sound from bouncing around when the people are talking. So it's also about trying to limit that in any way you can. And that's where that stuff, where these things as well, there's these soundproofing rug pads. I've never seen them on a video. I just saw them in these pictures when I was looking up dampening sound. Um, apparently there's just these like really thick pads that are kind of like soundproof pads that you can put on the ground and then you can put a rug over it. You don't notice it. It looks natural to the scene and it takes away the sound bouncing off the floor which I thought was pretty cool. I don't know how much they cost, but looks like they could be pretty expensive if any of these are them up here. Um, another thing you can do is you can just put down like carpet or flooring material. If it's a hardwood floor, if you're able to, if you have enough time and you have enough money for that, that's another thing I've seen people do. They just uh, get these rolls and unroll them. And then at the end of the shoot, roll them back up, use them on a different shoot. And it's not really even carpet. It's just kind of like this cardboard material. Um, and you can put whatever you want over it. And you can put a different rug over it to make it look like something. Or, or like I said, it's mainly this what stuff is used if you don't need to see the floor. Since you will have that softer material, it's kind of like cardboard, like I said. Um, if you do need to see the floor, 
you can always get like just a rug or some kind of material to put on the ground that looks natural to what a normal thing on the ground would look like, something like this. But yeah, anything you put in the room will, will start blocking sound. Hard surfaces, they're the problem in all these places, um, all these locations. And then just confined space, the problem is just noise from crew and noise from devices. So shooting in different locations, just be aware of these things. One example that they gave was a concrete shoot will have way more echo and will be way harder to uh, muffle sound than a shoot with hardwood floors, for example. Because um, even if hardwood so floors, they still have some um, give and take. So it, it has a little bit of absorption, but those concrete floors, usually like you can't get anything through it. So it's gonna be bouncing all over the place. Concrete even walls, if you cover it up. Yeah. Right. So just keep that in mind when looking for locations and see um, if you can work around that or if, you know, preferably you can find one that has um, better stuff that you can work with. But anything that makes your life easier, pretty much. Yeah, and especially it's if you have budget. to like ever shoot in like a warehouse location. There's going to be concrete floors. They're going to be wide open spaces, hard areas everywhere. So it's just always good if, depending on what location you're going to need, to know that you're going to need it as in advance as possible so that you can um, do all those studies and those tests before you and go through and do your research go through your budget and see what would cost more for you to uh, buy buy some material or if you already have some material that might help um that might help with uh, muffle that sound that echo a little bit or if it would cost less to just have a completely different place entirely to shoot because sometimes you already have stuff from the last shoot. Sometimes it's cheaper to buy just a carpet or something else. Um, let, borrow it with a friend. You know. Yeah, always so you always want to just keep that in mind too. If you're ever doing it, if you're the budgeter and you're the one leading the production. It's very independent film or independent project. Um, so you're wearing most of the hats. You just want to keep in mind that those things will come into play and you want to just be sure that whatever location you're trying to get, you think about all these different things because it, like Priscilla was saying, is it going to be cheaper to buy these sound blankets that you can use for your next shoot as well? Or is it going to be cheaper to just get a different location, even though it costs $25 more a day or whatever. And then you just want to kind of like compare and, and always do that. So just the pre-production work is just the most important in any shoot. And just uh, checking for these things for sound, since we're talking about sound, checking for these things for sound um, are always really important. Um, question, unrelated to this, but important. How many ounces are in a cup? Or how many grams are in a cup? Is it 16 ounces? 16 ounces in a cup? I think so, right? I can get away with two of them. OK, because I'm making dinner and I needed to know how many Little thing, little yogurt thingies to put in. Eight ounces. Okay, thank you, Raphael. So one and a is half. Is it eight? Ounces. Oh, it is eight. Well, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, V. All right, yeah, honey. Uh, next time I'll ask the smart people. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're thinking of pounds. There's, I think you're thinking of pounds. There's 16 ounces in a pound. I think. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. I was. I was like, oh crap. So it's not that. All right, so it's fine. Yeah, right. he was about to mess up dinner, she saw him, and then he was gonna blame it on me or blame it on the air fryer. You'll see. Hey, I said I think, so you should always double check. <laughs> if anyone ever says I think, just you know, double check behind them, everyone. No, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, does anyone have any questions or comments about the, or the sound information? Um, this is kind of related to it, but I remember I learned recently that apparently there's these, um, these bag of chips called, I think you know, uh, these bag of chips called Lex in Hollywood and they're fake. 
like they're basically empty and the chip bag is made out of some material. So it doesn't make much sound when they're trying to shoot. Like the like the sound doesn't um um like the bag doesn't make any ruffling sound when they're trying to shoot because that could be distracting during a scene. Oh, and that's cool. Cause yeah, like yeah. a bag of chips is gonna make a huge ton of crap ton of noise. Yeah, you, and the mic's pointed right at them. Yeah, apparently it's it's in like almost at, maybe not almost every movie, but a lot of popular movie movies. The chip bag is called like less. So yeah. I don't know, Ryan, it reminds me of soundproofing or whatever. <laughs> I know that they had a bunch of accessories and props and stuff like that, but that's a new one. Thank you. And also, guys, that's a tip. Don't, if, if you're writing a script, make sure to not have your character eating chips unless you want to pay for that thingy. Yes. <laughs> that might be pricey. You don't know. At least look it up beforehand. Yeah, it's always good to think about props. Um, if you're coming from sound, they're always talking about like how props, making sure if you need this them. Isn't, then... Let's chips is is that in like if they have to be eating chips? Is it like a specific brand of of prop no, chips or is it just a I'm prop? sure they don't show the brand, right? Or if they're no, if no, they are the, sponsored the chip, by brand. Okay. No, the chip bag and literally says let's. It's a fake brand. It's a right, it's, let's instead of lays. Yeah. Yeah, the bag is empty. It's just, it's just because I think they don't want to put something like lays or ruffles, something because it has something to do with maybe like. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they don't want to copyright trademark the product placement. Um, yeah. Unless they, they can pay the other people. It's common the for them to cover. Uh, it's common for them to cover up or like make new words out of like brand labels. Yeah. I was I. I was watching like some person with like a prop because because he was talking about like weights how they have like fake weights like Crap, if a person has to be lifting weights uh they have one that like weighs nothing and then if the person has to use the weights as a weapon they have one that like kind of weighs something that's like made out of rubber mm -hmm. and they have like the retractable ones and then they have the real one for just like certain shots if they're like doing a close up on it. Oh, the chip bag is right there. It's the one that says like. Where is it? In? It's like it's it's literally um. Like oh, that. Yeah, I see it right here. <laughs> yeah, that's this one. That's cool. I didn't know that. Hey, can do it. Bean bags, coffee. Apparently, that's. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, much. like a um. Paying attention to props for sound is also really important too, because um, like we were saying, I think it was last week or the week before, um, somebody had brought up that you, if you have a dinner scene and you're shooting the wide shot um, and they're all, you know, clanking their dishes, <clears throat> the utensils against the plate and cutting and, and putting their cups down and making all this noise. Then when you go into the close up. And you're trying to really isolate their sound and make sure that you're capturing their dialogue very well. If you can get them to just mimic that they're clanking that plate, that they're picking up that cup and putting it back on the table, that way it's not actually making all those noises. Um, it's a lot hey, better. For my sound. hands are dirty. Can you mute me, please? Yep. Thank you. This time she asked, see? <laughs> and then, um, that way, it's not making as much noise inside the mic so that you can pick up clear sound. But it's always up to the actor and the director because if the actor is doing a worse job or if they feel like they might do a worse job because they're not really, you know, cutting the meat or whatever, then um, performance will come first. But um, that is just something to keep in mind that any kind of prop that doesn't really need to be used, if they can just mimic it, it's probably going to be better, um, especially for sound because they don't want those different sounds coming in because you can add those later or you can pick up a wild track of them. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Any more questions or comments? All right, so last thing I wanna go over is that we are not gonna have a recording for Monday. Monday, we are going to watch a movie. We're going to use that movie. We're going to watch it for its lighting. Um, if anyone has any suggestions for that, let us know. 
Um, that's Remembering that we're going to watch one that's a little more stylized and one that's more natural. So don't worry if like that's what we're hoping to do. It's just like one that's kind of Blade Runner-esque, like a little more stylized and another one that's a little more realistic. So if you guys have any suggestions, especially um, because we've had experiences of like, well, I just watched that movie. Well, you should have given a suggestion then. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love you guys. But yeah, so um, just suggest something that you thought had really pretty lighting. Maybe look it up. I'll be doing my own research, of course. But, um, and you know, the final decision is ours because we're in charge. Um, kidding. <laughs> we'll vote. Um, I'm just in a joking mood today. But uh, yeah, so if you guys can just give us some suggestions of movies that you know won awards for lighting or should have won awards for lighting that are really uh, good. I probably won award for the cinematography, but yeah, it's same. Right. I'm sure the same, right. uh, same thing. Part Lighting is part of cinematography. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're going to be watching the movie for its lighting. We're going to be actually taking a shot or two um, screenshot or two from the movie and we're going to try to mimic that lighting as best as we can we're going to be that'll be our next exercise <laughs> like she said we're going to be watching two films this semester based on their lighting so if you pick one if you you know send us a suggestion and we don't pick it that doesn't mean we won't pick it ever it just needs to be available on either netflix it might, it might but probably not it needs to be available on either netflix hbo max youtube free or amazon prime Amazon Prime. Um, yeah. And if it's available on one of those, we can watch it. If oh, not. Disney Plus too, because his mom has that. Oh, true. Yeah. Um, but That's yeah, we're going to watch it for, it for its lighting, and then we're going to try to take a screenshot from that using what we have available. You know, we might not have actual lights, but trying to use whatever we have and shaping the light however we can to try to mimic it as best we can each. And, take and just picture. remembering that it doesn't have to be exactly perfect but the best you possibly can to look like it. Cause we know that not everyone has professional lights at home. We know that not everyone, um, you know, has all the fancy gels or whatever the crap. But at the end of the day, guys, it's just so we can have an idea of what goes into it, of how to do it, of how to get that look. It's, it's a fun exercise. Try not to um, be like, oh, I'm not gonna do it. Cause I don't, don't let that discourage you, you know? Yeah, um, and I just wanted to say when we do watch this movie, I'll, I'll mention this again Monday, but oh, when we do watch this movie, we're going to be paying attention to its lighting, style it, if it's stylistic, if it's, if it's realistic, um, any color contrast that it has, if it's high key, if it's low key, we're going to be paying attention to all that. And like we've done before in the past, we'll watch, you know, 20, 30 minutes of it, pause and discuss it and point out the things that we liked and didn't like and um, everything that we've done before, but it'll just be for its lighting this time. Thanks for the suggestion, she said. I'll, um, I'll let Priscilla know and she can check that out later, probably this weekend. Oh, can you screenshot it for me? I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm just gonna write it down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else has any suggestions, what was that? I already, did, I already did the recipe wrong, so. I already screwed it up. Well, if anyone else has any security. suggestions about it, sorry, what? Oh, Raphael? <laughs> sorry, just out of curiosity, are we still by any chance doing the room? Yes, yes. Yeah, I sorry, we were going to mention that. Um, it's been really oh, busy okay. with everything. But no, no, we no, do no, 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 I, did, I didn't remember this. Yeah. Okay. We were going to do that yesterday, and we, I, we forgot, but we are yeah, still planning happens. to watch the room and then watch the <laughs> Disaster Artist the week following. We just don't know that when was, yet. Yeah, that was okay. a last semester nag slash promise that we made that that uh, request that we had. We just, it's just curious. my work has been wanting me to come in more often, and I've been having to go in on Wednesdays, Tuesdays, and sometimes Thursdays for a few mm -hmm. hours. So it's just been a lot harder. And then with the shoot, yeah. so everything's been a little bit more busy than usual. But we definitely will. No worries, we can always no. do it later. No, but it is something that people were asking for and they thought it would be fun. And I think it will be fun, um, especially to see the contrast. Whew, I watched the trailer the other day because I was showing my mother-in-law. You can watch oh, it for what not to do with lighting. <laughs> oh, boy. Not to do with anything, really. <laughs> no, I know. That's why I'm not watching it for that. But, but yeah, 
We'll watch it at some point. I'll definitely watch it. I'm going to stop the recording there, though. But yeah, oh, yeah. If anyone has any suggestions for the movie, um, we will take a vote probably sometime this weekend. And then we will, or on Monday, we'll take the vote. And then uh, we will watch it Monday night. No recording next Monday.